probably the broadest view or will uh, be given uh, by the first talk given by Alison from um, so Alison is uh, uh, is a communication and fi fundraising professional uh, from uh, from Cornell University she uh, uh, is, uh, is an expert for communicating the science, but actually she also manages uh, uh, the archive um, system, I would say in the broad range. And please correct me if I was wrong in, 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 in a way. Uh, so I would, uh, I'm really looking forward to, to hear more about, you know, the motivation and inner workings of, of that, because I know we, we all know that, we all use that, but uh, it, and for me, it's really the first occasion to uh, to hear more about uh, the real motivation behind it and the inner workings. So, Alison, please, uh, the stage is yours. Great, thank you. Um, let me share my screen here. Um, and present. Get my windows straight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Um, yeah, so I am so pleased um, to be here. Thank you for um, inviting me. Can You can see my screen, right? You can see the, the yes. opening slide? Okay, great. Excellent. Um, so I'm Allison Frommy, and I have worked here at Archive since January of 2020. Um, as uh, Maxim said, I, um, I'm in communications and fundraising. So I'm part of the leadership team at Archive. Um, and today, uh, okay. um, today I have two parts to my talk. The first is about Archive the organization and the second is about um, how to post your own work to Archive and what happens after you click submit. I wasn't sure how familiar you all would be with Archive so, um, so you know, if you have questions, uh, I'm happy to answer them at the end. Um, so I'd like to start with a really simple, seemingly simple question, what is archive? And if you're already familiar with archive, you, um, you maybe you have an answer to this. Um, so I encourage you to take a minute. How, how, would, you, how would you answer this uh, question? You might say archive is a preprint server. You might say it's a repository. You might say it's an email. All right, sorry about that. So <clears throat> Archive's primary mission is to help researchers stay current in their fields, share their own work quickly, and fulfill open access requirements. Over the past two years, um, Archive has made strides in becoming more interoperable and, and well-connected with the rest of the scholarly communications uh, community. So we are celebrating um, our sorry, <laughs> 30th anniversary this year. Um, so I'd like to share a little bit of history. Long before Archive was around, researchers were in the practice of sharing preprints, um, which were drafts shared before publication. Uh, many of you know this already, I'm sure. Um, these drafts were printed and mailed to colleagues and they served an important purpose. They were distributed before peer review um, and faster than the official journal versions. And this was great if you were part of the right network of scientists, but if you were not on a particular researcher's snail mail list or at the right university, you would still have to wait for the published version. So this was a problem of access. And in the late 1980s, Joanne Cohn, who is now a UC Berkeley cosmologist, started to solve this access problem by manually curating a list of researchers around the world, collecting their digital preprints and sending them out. Um, back then, she couldn't just type an email address. She had to route the preprints to their destinations using BitNet. Um, and she couldn't just attach the preprints. Sometimes she had to like manually split them into multiple files and send them separately. Um, but this service that she was providing was, was really valued. And um, she started getting all kinds of requests to join the list. And she was doing this all for free if 
if you don't count her many hours of unpaid labor, um, which soon became untenable. So what happened next? Um, at a conference, Joanne ran into Paul Ginsberg, the physicist, who said, hey, why don't you automate that list? And he offered to do it. Um, so Joanne had grown this social network to about 200 people, small by today's standards, but it was a big deal back then. Um, and she passed this project on to Paul and he automated it. So um, since then, archive has grown exponentially. And why is this? It's because the service archive provides is useful to researchers like you. You wanna share your work at the moment you feel it's ready to your global community without a paywall. Um, and the original promise of archive still holds up today. It's, it's really quite amazing. So today archive is a truly global service with readers around the world, authors submitting articles from around the world. Um, and I wanna highlight um, the, uh, the people behind the operation. So more than 240 member institutions who are represented mainly by librarians voluntarily fund archive by becoming members. Um, you can check out the website at the bottom to see if your university is a member. 190 moderators screen submissions for basic quality. 26 board members offer expertise and advice and 12 staff members run daily operations. Now, unsurprisingly, uh, this requires a lot of funding um, and people often say, oh, archive is free. <laughs> and that is sort of true. Archive is free for readers and authors, but it is not free to operate. So um, we're super grateful to the community that supports us. Cornell Tech, which is the New York City campus of Cornell University, is our organizational home. Um, the Simons Foundation has provided substantial funding for at least a decade and other contributors like the member libraries that I mentioned and also nonprofit and corporate donors and individuals all provide critical funding to ensure that archive stays open. And I mean open in the broadest sense, right? Um, open to the world, open and free. So, now I want to switch gears a little bit to how does archive work from the researcher's perspective. Archive was created to provide this direct line between authors of research and readers of research. And of course, those are often the same people. <laughs> um, so if we start over here on the left, hooray, this um, researcher has work uh, results to share. They submit their manuscript. Um, usually it's in LaTeX. Um, and after they click submit, moderators and automated systems check the work um, for basic quality measures. This is not the same as peer review. Then a full text PDF is produced online at 8 p.m. Um, most days of the week. And an email listing of new papers is sent to subscribers. Those readers read the work and then all kinds of work happens outside of archive, of course, like um, new research, new versions of the same research, um, and that's submitted and the cycle continues. Okay. So I want to zoom out a bit and explain how this fits into different aspects of academic publishing. Um, so, you know, features of academic publishing include registration, like who um, submitted a scientific result first. Academic publishing also provides distribution, preservation, use and reuse, and a kind of certification or stamp of approval by peer review. Now, Archive is not a publisher. As I said, it's a research sharing platform. Um, but Archive provides nearly all of these features with the exception of peer review. Um, so, uh, some of you here might be already using Archive, so thank you for being part of the community. For those of you who are new to Archive, this is just a brief primer on um, how to submit your work. First, I suggest learning about the process um, 
learning about the submission practices and policies. Second, um, considering your subject category. I've included a few here as um, possible categories that your work might fit into. Also, I wanna add that we have an automated classifier that will let you know if the system disagrees with your choice. <laughs> um, so there's a little AI involved in that. Uh, third, you need to become a registered user. Fourth, um, you have to consider available licenses and um, these are the licenses that we currently support. Uh, fifth, prepare your manuscript. And again, the most popular format is LaTeX. And then finally, start your submission. I put this as the, as the last step because you'll probably save yourself some time and frustration if you learn about the process before you actually have something ready to, um, ready to submit. I also want to add that Archive is a permanent repository. So once posted, submissions cannot be removed. Um, so you need to be sure that you're submitting exactly what you want to submit. There are only very rare cases when we um, remove a submission, for example, if the submitter didn't have the legal right to submit the work. So once you, um, once you click submit, your paper will go through a series of human and automated checks. Most submissions are accepted. Um, I think that number hovers around 90% of submissions are accepted. Sometimes submissions are put on hold or declined. For example, if it's not research or if there's excessive text overlap with a previous submission um, or if there's a question about which category it belongs to in. Um, most issues that are not serious, um, most issues that, are lead, that lead to holds are resolved within 48 hours. And our team of four staff members and 196 moderators are all constantly working to balance resources with, you know, our desire to meet quality assurance standards, um, service goals to be able to, to scale up and provide fast service for authors. So just to give you a scale, a sense of scale, the scale that we're talking about, we receive as many as um, 1200 new submissions per day. Um, and up to a thousand other types of submissions like new versions. If your paper is accepted without any hiccups and you've submitted before 2 p.m. on a weekday other than Friday, um, your paper will appear online at 8 p.m. The weekend is a little bit different. Papers that, have, that come in before 2 p.m. on Friday are announced at 8 p.m. on Sunday, and then all the weekend papers appear on Monday. Um, so a few important considerations. As I said before, the license you choose really matters. And a lot of times we get questions about which license to choose, but we unfortunately can't provide any advice on that because we don't know your particular situation. For example, um, funders and and journals require uh, have, have different work requirements, and we just can't um, can't offer that kind of advice. Um, secondly, I, we invite you to link your papers with data and code through our collaboration with papers with code. Um, and finally, don't forget to link your ORCID number with your archive account so that um, we know it's you <laughs> and, and uh, you know, better identification. So of course, I think you should share your work on archive, but you don't have to take it from me. Um, researchers on Twitter are constantly telling us why they use archives. So I just wanted to share a couple examples here. Um, this one is, uh, shows that um, they, uh, they value archive for speed. They published language models in December of 2020. By April 1st, people had already used those models to win competitions. Um, the conference version was three, still three months away. Um, this person values archive because it's free. He says, I'm done with OA at, through conventional journals. Um, you know, he's, gonna, to, he's going to um, submit to archive, meta archive and bio archive. By the way, I just wanna make clear that um, 
MedArchive and BioArchive are run by a completely different organization, even though the names are very similar. Uh, this person values archive because it's free and accessible. Um, and I wanted to specifically mention this one. Um, this, this person shares that they submit to archive um, and they submitted to archive and then published in an overlay journal. So editors of um, overlay journals select articles that are already freely available online and then peer review them. And I'm actually not sure if the MRI community already has overlay journals, um, but it might be something to consider. We don't always know how people are using archive because of the openness. Um, people don't have to tell us or ask. <laughs> so I'd be curious to hear from you on that. Uh, so, so where is archive headed in the future? In an earlier diagram, you saw a simple circle where the researcher submits their work, it's distributed to readers, it sparks new research, the cycle continues. Um, so when we look toward the future, one possibility that we're excited about is more connectivity with the scholarly communications landscape, more interoperability with other services, perhaps more content types, um, and all of this, you know, to support a vibrant global research community. I share these ideas not as a promise, um, because we have a very small team and we have limited resources, but, but I'm sharing it as inspiration and sort of to spark a conversation. What would you like to see in archives future? How can, and how can the community work together to make it happen? Archive is really a community organization. Um, so uh, thank you for your time and interest. Um, I'm happy to take a couple of questions. Here on this slide are some links that you might find um, useful. We encourage you to connect with us on social media, check, you know, keep up to date on our news, on our blog. Um, you can join the archive testing group, um, user tester group, and also apply to be a moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Alison, for this uh, excellent and very in inspiring presentation. Um, um, do we have any, oh, we have a question or comment uh, in the chat. Very interesting things. What is vixra.org? Can you comment? Um, yeah, that is isn't. Uh, that is a, um, a site that has, that is not associated with archive. I think it's, um, maybe satire or maybe, um, papers that are, uh, that were not included on archive. I'm actually, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but it is not, it is not associated with archive. Okay. Well, I would have a question, uh, uh, if, if I may, because I don't see any more uh, questions in the chat. Uh, uh, it's, I, I really, uh, really appreciate your mission and your efforts which you invest. Uh, did you get some problems with publishers? Uh, do they accept your exist or, I mean, you're taking some business away from them because some people don't like to publish in the paid uh, journals or whatever. So uh, could you comment about that? What yeah, um, well, we, um, it's not our goal to put publishers out of business necessarily. <laughs> um, you know, pu publishers provide a different service. Peer review is a different service than what we offer. And, um, and peer review is still really valued in the scientific community. Um, and, you know, often the basis for promotions and tenure and whatnot. So, um, so we see archive as providing, you know, a place it's in some ways you could see it as like the raw material research that then other services build on top of. Um, and another interesting thing is just the way it's been adopted by different communities. You know, it started kind of in physics, astrophysics, um, math, computer science. And in those communities, it's become, such an integral part of the way science is communicated that, um, you know, 
it's just it's part of the <laughs> part of the landscape um again it's not uh you know it's not necessarily one or the other okay thank you we have uh, one more question in the chat from uh, francesco and he asks uh, if you see uh, other preprints other preprint surfaces as competition or if you do welcome them as a complementary uh, surface to your to what you are offering yeah that's a good question um we <laughs> well as i said we have a small team and we're um we're often overwhelmed with the amount of work that we ha already have so we welcome <laughs> other um other uh preprint services you know uh, um and we're we've actually had some really great uh, conversations, for example, with the bioarchive folks. Um, in fact, um, if you go to our YouTube channel, um, there's a great, a great um, video of the bioarchive people explaining like how they built off of archives ideas. Um, you know, we see that as very complimentary. It's a different, you know, different subjects, different areas, right? Uh, I see another one that just came in. Oh. Yeah, so that question is from Sophie. Would the archive ever consider adding a, adding a peer review surface uh, if there were companies or organizations that could uh, facilitate that? Yeah, so that's a great question that that seems to be coming up more and more frequently <laughs> lately. Um, we don't have any explicit plans to do that soon and by soon i mean like in the next year or so um but that doesn't mean it's not on the table it's really we really rely on our advisory boards we actually have two advisory boards right now we have the member advisory board and the scientific advisory board and um they are the ones who would make this kind of decision because they represent the community that uses archive um so yeah, it's a great question. I don't have like a really specific answer. <laughs> Maybe I have uh, one uh, follow up question on the peer review uh, issue. Uh, do you consider archive to be suitable for specific sciences more than the other, for instance, the technical sciences where you uh, would publish methods or algorithms uh, rather than perhaps biological or medical sciences? Or do you see no difference between that? Yeah, well, right now we support the subjects that we, um, you know, we have this community of moderators and they cover specific subjects. And so occasionally other communities have come to us and asked like, oh, would you consider adding this new category? Um, and these, um, it always requires a lot of um, research to figure out if it makes sense, like if the culture already exists, is there truly a demand? Do we have the people power to actually support this community? Um, and so, uh, so right, we serve the communities we serve because it has bubbled up from the community. So if there, if an expansion were to happen again, that would like go through the advisory boards, we would make sure that there was the right demand and, and whatnot. So yeah, I hope that answers. 